Hey guys, uh, Dr. Ken Arberg again. <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, got a special subject we're going to talk about today. It's a three parts subject. But, uh, before I get going, uh, I want to mention we're going to be experimenting with a new YouTube feature called Premiere. So look for that. Uh, we're, right now, uh, John and I are getting ready to do some scouting. Can't wait for that. So. Before long, we'll be we'll be presenting some YouTube presentations in the woods, and I can't wait to start being able to do that. Might be a little complication for me in between here. You might have noticed my voice is strong again. It's not perfect yet, but it appears <laughs> the nerve that was damaged while having surgery on my carotid artery last November has finally regenerated. You know, just not too long ago I woke up in the morning and said hello to my dog and, and uh, right away said, what's happened to my voice? It's strong. It's good again. I, it's not that whispery kind of voice I've been having a lot during the past year. I've been going through 10 months of that. So it appears <coughs> uh, that nerve that was cut has regenerated, and I have a voice. What that means is, at this point, uh, I should set up a date to have the surgery done on my other carotid artery. And so uh, that's going to interfere with some of my scouting, and I'm going to make sure, I'm going to do my garments to make sure it doesn't interdo, interfere with my deer hunting this year. I've been looking forward to it so much. You know, I'm like, I was when I was a 10-year-old, can't wait to go deer hunting. But before I get going on this subject today, I just want to mention too that you guys have been really great about uh, subscribing to my YouTube channel and punching that little button, uh, the thumbs up button. I really appreciate that. It's been really good. And really appreciate all you guys buying my book. And you're good. You're going to love that book the rest of your life. You, you wait and see. So much of what I try to teach you here on the internet, I, I cover in little pieces, little parts. And even then, uh, every once in a while I keep saying, you know, I need to talk more about this subject. And what I taught you up to this point was good, but it's not the whole story. And that's kind of what this talk is about today. The title, I guess you'd call it, is How Whitetails Identify as Hunters. And uh, mainly using their senses, uh, uh, hearing and seeing and smelling. And it seems as if there's a fourth sense. We'll talk about that. It's almost certain. <laughs> well, let's start with seeing. Ordinarily, we look like Nothing else a whitetail has ever seen. Uh, we walk on our hind legs <laughs> instead of on all four like all the other animals they see in the woods. Uh, we have a short little neck. And all the other animals in the woods have long necks. We have this little nose on the front of our face. And all, all those other animals in the woods have muscles that stick out from, from their face, from their heads with a black nose on the end, our nose is light colored. <laughs> and uh, our ears, they're hardly noticeable. And everything else out there in the woods has great big ears that move independently. But we don't have anything like that. So it, you'd think it would be really easy for our whitetails to identify us by sight. Yeah, and considering the fact that uh, they can see at night, almost as well, if as well, uh, as they can by day, you think their eyes must be terribly sensitive. And in some ways they are. But even so, I mean, all the years I've been hunting whitetails and all the years I've been studying whitetails, I, I've se seen it time and time again, just, and it has never stopped, where I've had whitetails looking straight at me and obviously not realizing I was a human. Uh, black bears are even worse for that. You know, you, I have never taken a black bear that didn't look right at me uh, at least three times. 
from a short distance away, seven yards or seven feet, look right at me and not realize I was a human with a bowl <laughs> at full draw. Or, or, and uh, it's kind of unusual. You think uh, animals that uh, are re as resilient as white tails would have eyes that would, would fail to identify you like that when they're close. But it's true. I've sat in the woods, you know, every time I used to go up and spend some time in my study area, I didn't put on camouflage clothing most of the time. I always took my head nap because, you know, your, your bare skin makes you much more visible to white tails than, than when you're wearing a camel head nap. So I always used that. And all the years I started using camel head nets back in 1960. Then I bought in a war surplus store. <laughs> they were, they were military type of uh, things. But, so I always did that. But in all those years, see I had white tails feeding on grass right under my primitive platforms, you know, I just I had stout branches nailed together up between branches sticking out from a tree and that would be my, my permanent tree stand. I'd climb up there and uh, I could be sitting up there with my feet dangling over the edge and I could have white tails come along and feed right underneath my platform. <laughs> I could almost touch their heads with my feet. And I had them go walk a little ways away and they apparently were done feeding and they'd lay down and start chewing their cuds, you know, cuds just a little ways away. And they, they never identified, I could be wearing blue jeans and a plaid shirt and a cap the visor on it and, and, and um, gloves and my head net. And there they'd be and they wouldn't notice that I was a human, only six feet above the ground. And, <laughs> so that was kind of amazing. But so just because a whitetail is looking in your direction when you're out there hunting doesn't mean it has identified you. It might be really curious about what you are if, for example, you're up in a tree and your dark silhouette against the sky is really obvious, you know, the whitetails have become, have become really uh, good at identifying the silhouette of a human nowadays. But even then, you might look up there and there's this big dark thing up there. Now, you can see differences in how different whitetails respond when they see a dark silhouette like that in the tree. Uh, or on the ground even. Uh, one of the most recent experiences I had was I was taking a shortcut to get to a, a special stand site uh, because, uh, at a time of midday because a midday feeding cycle was just beginning or was in progress uh, and I won't talk about what caused that. I've covered that before but anyway I was kind of in a hurry and I, I decided I would take a shortcut across this opening and I was about halfway across, and here comes three does. Two, well, it was probably a mature uh, doe, the, the, the mother of the other two, and one was a yearling doe, and one was a fawn, three of them. They come out of heavy cover, you know, thick trees, over on the left, probably about 50 yards away, and started to cross that opening right out in front of me. Well, the moment I saw them coming out of there, I froze. I didn't move. And you know, they went right by me and then went around this rocky the promontory that stuck up out toward where I was heading, went around the corner and disappeared into the woods and never acted alarmed the whole time. Well, breeding was in progress at that time. So I was wondering, I wonder if a buck was following, was with them, following. Well, so I looked back toward where they came, and pretty soon I spied a deer's head moving in that cover. And the head came up and it looked right toward me, and it had antlers, I couldn't see exactly how large they were, but it was a buck, no doubt about it. And then the head disappeared. And of course, I just stood there, frozen, wondering if 
that buck was going to come out of that area just like the does. And it was, maybe one of the does was in the, in the heat and it was following them. I thought, well, there's a possibility. Or at least maybe it would step out far enough so it was in the open. But he never did. He, that one glimpse I had was all I got from the buck. And later I went over there, snow on the ground, and found great big tracks. And no doubt about it, it was a big buck and uh, almost certainly the dominant breeding buck of the area. But they, see, there were differences in the way these deer reacted upon seeing uh, a stationary silhouette that looked like a human out in the open, just standing there. Well, those three deer that came out before, they weren't, they didn't recognize there was a human, went right by without looking back. They, their mind was getting over to this browse area <laughs> because a midday feeding cycle was starting. But that buck, he wasn't fooled. He saw, he saw the same thing and for that reason he stayed back in the cover and then disappeared. He finally figured out how to get to where the does went. He knew they were where they were going more than likely. So he went around a rebound way to get to where the does were. But uh, but I didn't see any of those deer after that, that particular day. But what I'm getting at is older bucks will react to the same things that all the other deer see in a different way. They are much more cautious about seeing things like a human silhouette whether it's on the ground or in the tree. And so, if you're going to be a buck hunter, you can't hunt bucks uh, the same way you would hunt other deer. Whitetails are not just whitetails. Actually, there are five different uh, classes of, behavioral classes of deer, all reacting in a different way to uh, hunting-related situations. So. Don't, so anyway, that's one thing to keep in mind. Silhouette is a bad thing, especially if you're hunting an older buck. What that means is, wherever you stand hunt, now, when you're, if you're not a stand hunter, you're exposing your silhouette not only to one deer once in a while, but a whole bunch of them that you never see, especially if they're older bucks. Uh, you can see all kinds of older bucks, uh, or you could, pass close to them if you're hunting on foot during the day of hunting and never realize they're near. Um, for one reason, one reason is that one of, the, one of the things their eyes never miss or rarely miss is motion. They see something moving out there in the woods, they want to know what it is right away. They're going to freeze where they are and they're going to stare in the direction of that thing, whatever it was, when it moved. Well. If it was a squirrel, or say a red squirrel or a chipmunk, you know, it might go up a tree and they'd see the motion and it's climbing a tree, or it might stay on the ground and way down here. But if it's a human that moved, that upper part of it, you know, we're up there five, six feet tall and, and taller, if that motion was up there and it was kind of a big thing, not much bigger than a squirrel or, or a bird, it's kind of a big thing. Well, what could that be? The only two things that could get where that tall would be a black bear standing up on his hind legs, which they sometimes do, or it was maybe a moose, or maybe another deer. But then, if it was another deer, and, and they were looking at it, and now oh, they see a long muzzle, a black nose on the end of it, and, and ears going this, that independently moving around like that. Oh, if the head comes up and there's antlers sticking up, well, that's a deer. But that never happens when they see the move, um, human moving, never see the ears or the antlers or, or the long muzzle with the black nose on the end, or maybe a white throat patch or white around the eyes. They don't see those things if it's a human. So any deer that has survived three years of deer hunting, will instantly recognize that's a human. So that should tell you something about how you should be hunting. If their eyes are really sensitive to motion, you shouldn't be moving around, especially during periods when white tails normally feed. That's when they're up and about moving around. You should be sitting still, and meaning you should be a stand hunter. And you don't have to sit high in a tree 
to avoid being identified by whitetails nowadays. You can sit at ground level as well, as long as you've got really good cover around you, so their silhouette is not obvious. Actually, it's easier to find that kind of cover at ground level than up in a tree. You get up there so high. Why is everybody sitting 16 feet or higher in trees nowadays? That is so bad. It's very dangerous. You know, the hunters are killed falling from tree stands that high above the ground all the time. Um, it, it, it's not good. Uh, I just don't, you know, I'm, well, I'm thinking of my age, but I'm, I suppose I'm a little more clumsy now in my old age, but you aren't going to get me up in that tree. You know, I'm talking like some guys, I remember back in the 1970s and 80s, and I'd put on a deer hunting seminar and I'd stand there on a stage in front of the, all these guys, and I'd say, if you want to be a successful buck hunter, you got to sit in a tree stand. <laughs> and, and I'd have guys come to my booth afterwards and say, you never get me sitting up in a tree. I wouldn't do anything like that. That's dangerous. And, it, and it's not very comfortable besides. That was before portable tree stands were invented. And so, but you never get me up there. <laughs> now, and I used to argue with these guys, and oh, you got to try it and doing this and that. You know, do this and that. And nowadays, oh no, you never get me sitting on the ground. I'm going to sit up there in a tree. Everybody wants to be in a tree. Well, but up there you're more visible against a bright sky than you are when you're on the ground. You got forest cover all around you and deep grasses and what. You're far, far less visible. And being less visible, you're less likely to be identified when you move. And of course, if you're hunting deer, sometimes you got to move. You got to, first of all, you wonder what made that twig snap over this way. You said, turn your head. And if you turn your head and look right into the eyes of this doe standing there looking toward you because it spotted your emotion, you're dead in the water. <laughs> you aren't, unless you want to hunt a doe, but well, any deer, if that happens, when you hear that sound, you turn your head, maybe fast. You know, what is that? <laughs> Boy, that's sure to be seen by a deer within 30 yards, even in dense forest cover. They might uh, see much of it. Something moved over there. Well, was it up in a tree or was it on the ground or what? Well, that deer, if it's survived three or more hunting seasons, it's going to want to know about, want to know what made that motion before it does anything else. Because that's the way to survive nowadays, their deer seasons. So it's going to watch over there for more motions or listen or listen carefully for sounds that might identify whatever it was that moved. But, um, but keep that in mind, you know, if, you, if you're sitting in forest cover and you've got good cover, except for your head, you know, you've got to be able to look up over all the dense cover around you. You might have little things in front of you that help to break up uh, your head as far as uh, vision is concerned. But when you move your head, don't ever make quick motions like that. You know, don't turn your head quickly. It, no matter how, you know, you might, you might even hear a buck grunt over there. <laughs> and, oh yeah, you got to look at it, but don't do that. Go very slowly. And if you do that, a deer that's 30 yards away probably won't figure out that you're a human. You know, it might look your way several times, you know, but it doesn't see any motions, obvious motions. Pretty soon it's going to forget about you and start doing whatever it was before now. So motions are your enemy. So st that's why stand hunting is best for taking older, older bucks. That's why uh, stand hunting is best for, especially at ground level, I'm kind of you know, I'm really stuck on ground level hunting now. I have been for a long time. Uh, I, you know, I, I hunted from, my kids and I hunted from permanent tree stands from between the early 60s until uh, about 1989. Uh, well, no, before that. We started using, that's right, we started using portable tree stands. We had a chain on type tree stands and we had climbers too back in those days. 
uh, beginning about 1985. So I have had a lot of experience and a lot of deer hunting from permanent tree stands. That was the only way you could get off the ground, be comfortable and safe in a tree. So, uh, but uh, it's been, I, we haven't built a permanent tree stand since uh, 1989. That's the last time we built permanent ones. And they were pretty elaborate with railings, and, but none of them made with mill wood, you know, like t freshly made two by fours, really bright colored things and, t and plywood and all that kind of stuff. Uh, ours were made from tree branches, so they looked like they were part of the tree. And, or, you know, well, many of them were made between three and four tree trucks that were close together. And uh, you know, the ladders were made from tree branches. We did that on purpose so they would not be as obvious in the woods. But anyway, when it comes to vision, uh, Quick motions are bad. You don't want to ever move quickly. All your motions should be very slow when you're out there in the woods. And uh, why don't you do that? You're going to see more deer. Now, another thing, concern with motions. I've seen it happen many times. Not only with with uh, deer, but with bear. When you got when I've got a bear out in front of me. On bait, you know, I was eating some of my bait, and uh, I remember the old days when uh, if he wasn't standing quarter and away, I always waited for the quarter and away shot on a bear, especially a big bear. <coughs> uh, that bear could be out in front of me for 15 minutes or more before I'd finally have a chance to fire at it. And there's been some I never got a chance. <laughs> the bear was always kind of facing toward me and every once in a while we'd look around and look up at me, you know, I suppose he saw that silhouette there and he probably smelled me. That's part of the, what you do when you hunt bears with bait, you get them accustomed to your odors. And so he's sitting there, he smelled the human, but that, that smell has always been a part of the bait that, that was out in the woods. Every time he came to the bait, he could smell me. So anyway, uh, but they seem to have a sense, and I've seen humans like that too. I've tried it on different humans in different cases, but where if you're staring at them, they seem to suddenly realize something's staring at me and they'll turn and look up at, toward you or look toward you. And so whenever I had a bear for years and years, when I had a bear out in front of me, I would keep track of its movements and what it was doing by peripheral vision only. You know, and uh, that way it, the bear wouldn't suddenly sense something was looking at it. And I've done that with deer as well. I've had deer out in front of me walking, feeding, close to but If I stared right at them when they were there, some of them would suddenly look up at me. <laughs> and so I could learn to, to watch their movements too uh, through peripheral vision only until it was time to bring my rifle or bow up to my. So anyway, uh, keep that in mind too. You got one close, don't keep staring at it. Look over to one side, watch its motions and movements. And like when it steps behind to cover between you and the, and the deer, that's a great time to get your, as long, anytime you can see one or both eyes of a deer or bear out in front of you, that's within 30 yards, um, you sh uh, should not, you shouldn't move uh, until its head is pointing straight away or uh, its head is hidden by intervening cover. That's time to finally move slowly, nice and smooth. Uh, th at this point, you don't want to be having to put your bow up here like I've seen a lot of guys do. Get their bow up, they have 95, 90 pounds bull on there and they're struggling to get it done. They can't just go straight back. So I learned always, when I'm using a bow, to always draw straight back. You don't, that way there isn't as much vertical movement going on that will catch the attention of that deer or bear out in front of you. Okay, enough about vision. Be sure to visit my website. Here's the link. 
material find links to my blog posts, my Twitter account, my YouTube account, my Amazon store with links to my ebooks, my son's eBay store, a money saver if you're ordering from Canada or other countries, my website bookstore, and much more.